On behalf of the United Growth of Kent County Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome you to our ninth annual Land Use Luncheon. Uh, my name is Mike Williams. I'm the Vice President of the United Growth Board. Um, our lunch will begin now. They, they're going to bring it around, and uh, while they're starting, um, I'll get us off the ground here. Uh, enjoy the lunch. Uh, it has a lot of locally grown foods, um, and this great turnout has created a little bit of a problem, uh, so we have to adjust the agenda somewhat. Um, we're sorry about that. Uh, the networking had to be foreshortened a bit. Please feel free to stay around at the end and uh, continue your networking if you wish. Uh, we've become, uh, United Growth uh, for Kent County has become an independent nonprofit corporation with 501c3 status just over a year ago. Uh, we're grateful for the many years of support that MSU Extension has provided us and we're pleased to honor one of the original creators of United Growth with our Land Use Stewardship Award, Dave Geikema. No need to applaud now. <laughs> that, that'll come shortly. We're also pleased that we have 10 representatives of various land use organizations uh, providing three minute updates. Uh, note the speaker order on your uh, agenda. Uh, Christine Helms Miletic is not able to come, so we'll start with Roger Sabon. As usual, Kendra will be timing your update for those of you who will be presenting. Once you hear the beep, you are asked to turn over the podium <laughs> to the next speaker. The board is honored to host the Kent County Commission Candidate Land Use Forum today. Uh, and these uh, people will be seated up in the front at that time. We have 12 candidates who will be presenting. The forum will be moderated by board member Kim Van Dyke. Four questions will be asked. The questions were developed by the United Growth Board and will be distributed to participants, or were distributed to participants in advance. Uh, because of the number of participants, we had to reduce response time for candidates to one minute each per person, per question. These are politicians. <laughs> this is going to be a miracle. Anyway, so responses will be timed. I assume it will be the beeper again. Uh, but this is not a debate, okay? It's simply a, a forum. Uh, time won't allow us to permit questions from the audience, but if you do have questions, you're welcome to stay and uh, speak to the particular candidate that you'd like to. Have you know, as you've noticed, Grand Rapids Community College is videotaping uh, for viewing by the public on uh, GRCC's public access station available in the Grand Rapids area, so be on your best behavior. <laughs> Before we begin the three minute updates, I wanted to give you a brief overview of what United Growth has been working on for the past several months. We have a revitalizing neighborhoods committee uh, an offshoot or an outgrowth, I guess, of what used to be the Urban Committee. It secured a $15,000 grant from the Dyer Ives Foundation to provide information to neighborhoods and businesses about how the new City of Grand Rapids zoning ordinance works. With the help of our MSU Urban Planning Summer Intern, the committee developed a PowerPoint presentation which will be delivered by several committee members at 12 up upcoming neighborhood and business association meetings. The RNC, as we call it, has been working on a set of indicators also that will measure the health of neighborhoods. United Growth Land Preservation Education Committee, uh, an offshoot of what used to be known as the Rural Committee, has been working on a project that is funded by the Fry Foundation and the Lowell Area Community Fund to contact families that own 40 acres or more in the townships of Ada, Virgins, Alpine, and Sparta to discuss their land preservation interests. With the help of several sponsors, the committee published a wonderful brochure titled The, the Land Preservation Guide, and it really is an excellent uh, piece, which is being widely distributed to property owners in those townships. 
This committee also provided assistance toward the development of conservation easements donated by Mr. Peter Wege that protected 577 acres of his property along the Parnell Corridor in Virgins Township. As most of you know, the United Grove Coalition meets monthly on the third Tuesday of each month from 8.30 to 9.30 at Kent MSU Extension. These meetings are open to the public. In 2008, many presentation topics related to al alternative energy. We posted experts on geothermal and wind energy, and we have a speaker on solar energy at our November 18th meeting. For 2009, we're interested in your ideas for presentation topics. Please provide any thoughts you might have on your evaluation form before you leave today. Again, call your, call your attention to your evaluation form. Finally, with the end of our three-year grant from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, United Growth relies heavily on membership dues for its daily operations and projects. For those of you who are members, we, are, we greatly appreciate your support. United Growth's membership campaign takes place in the spring of each year with membership starting on May 1st. If you'd like what you hear today, or you'd like to change it and you want to participate, please consider supporting United Growth with a $25 individual membership or $100 and up organizational membership. With that, I'd like to turn the podium over to Roger Sabine, a fellow United Growth, excuse me, he's not on the United Growth board, but he's with the Kent County Parks Department, and he will give us an update on what that organization has been doing. Okay, I can always tell who's... Uh, Christmas card list I'm on when my name's pronounced, so uh, Sorry, Roger. no problem. <laughs> um, Roger Sabine, I'm the director at Kent County Parks and uh, have been for over 10 years now and been with the system for 25. Um, in 1998, the Kent County um, Board of Commissioners uh, made land acquisition a priority and over the last 10 years we've acquired nearly 3,000 acres. We currently have about 60, uh, 500 acres and we're looking at uh, a system that is in the neighborhood of 7,500, maybe 8,000 acres. The uh, 1969 master plan for Kent County Park said we we're going to have a system of 14,400 acres. So. Uh, that, that will not happen. But uh, some key land acquisitions uh, uh, in the recent, in the past year since the last meeting, uh, we added to Hazy Cloud Park, which is uh, in Ada, nearly 100 acres and a uh, million dollars. Um, we've also uh, added some uh, smaller acreage around uh, at, a, at a number of parks for the last year. Um, trail building continues to be a focus of Kent County Parks. Uh, you'll see some trail activity being built along M6. It's a connector trail between uh, Kent Trails and the Paul Henry Thornapple Trail. And uh, you'll see some development in the next year that is along Four Mile Trail connecting the Muscatawa to the White Pine Trail. Uh, both of those uh, projects were funded by uh, federal dollars, high priority projects. Uh, so, and that's through the last transportation bill. Um, and in addition to that, I guess uh, we, as best we can, improve parks on a regular basis. Uh, this year's project was at Myers Lake Park, which uh, significantly changed the character of that park. And I guess I'll conclude with that. Hello, my name is Kevin Whistling. I'm on the United Growth uh, Board and also representing here the Rapids today. Um, 
So Rapid, we're the uh, public transportation provider in the Grand Valley region. You probably both know us for the main, like the big buses going down the street and kind of the urbanized Grand Rapids areas. And we provide a variety of other transportation services, um, including disability services and ride share uh, throughout the region. Um, overall, we had a very good, we were having a very good year at the Rapid. Um, looking back to 2007, we had 8.1 million rides on the Rapid, which is about a 10% increase over the previous year. Um, this year, Rogers has been just increasing even at a higher pace given the gas prices and the other constraints and um, the service improvements. And right now we're projected to reach about 9 million rides on the RAP for uh, fiscal year 2008. So um, people are demanding the service and ridership keeps going up. Um, in addition, um, in August we've implemented service improvements including a new route to the west side, Route 18, um, and other frequency and time improvements to make this system more usable for everyone. Um, in our other services, we have an online carpool matching service for our commuters throughout the region, and the registrations um, over the past six months have basically doubled on that service. So people are really looking for transportation alternatives. Um, unfortunately, we are facing the same constraints that everyone else is in terms of our fuel costs, which are much, much higher than expected. So um, we're looking for ways to keep our costs down and to manage the budget. Um, and unfortunately, we'll be having fare increases um, in October 1st to help manage the, uh, the, co the high cost of providing the transportation. I'm um, looking ahead with a few, uh, a number of exciting things in the future. Uh, one is the uh, with a bus rapid transit uh, project we're uh, implementing on South Division from downtown, the Medical Mile down to 60th and uh, Division. Um, it'll provide a, a new level of transit service, basically like kind of a light rail or a rail service on rubber tires. Um, we received a grant from the federal government to complete this project, and now we're working out some issues such as local match um, from the state government and other funding and study issues. But uh, we're very optimistic about the project and hopefully we can have this going by uh, 2012. We're also, there's a group looking at a downtown streetcar study to provide like, like a, a trolley type service in the, on Monroe Avenue in the downtown area. Um, and then working with a number of other studies out the, throughout the area to improve public transportation service in the Grand Valley region. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, I'm Harold Mast. Um, I will also be up here on the panel. I'm a county commissioner from Kent County, but I'm talking with you today as past executive director of Genesis Nonprofit Housing Corporation, and I asked to give just a little update about what we're doing. As some of you know, anyway, we're a developer of affordable housing for people with disabilities. Uh, we have decided, as part of our mission, to develop housing that is not only affordable, but also is built green. Our first project, building with green principles in mind, was our Kingsbury Place project, and that received a silver LEED H uh, certificate. We did that primarily with uh, new insulation, new uh, energy, uh, um, efficient heating and cooling, as well as an underground cistern that collects groundwater, and, and we use that for sprinkling purposes. But I'm talking here today about a, a project that we're currently constructing, the first affordable assisted living project in the state. Uh, sometime back, MISHTA and Department of uh, Community Health Officers to the Aging and DHS put out a call for proposals from organizations, nonprofit organizations, to build affordable assisted living using the funding that comes through the Offices of Services to the Aging for the supports for it, but using MISHTA uh, qualified and accessible funding. We were successful in becoming the first project that's underway, and we're building that as a 55 unit apartment building at 2100 Leonard Street, our Heron Highland site. That, we hope, will be platinum uh, lead age uh, successful. We're putting in a geothermal system. We built a building out of insulated concrete forms that's got like 13, 14 inch walls, extremely tight. Uh, we hope to be able to save a lot of money for the residents in terms of utilities. But I'm, but I'm here just to kind of announce that because it will be coming out probably February, March in marketing and, and bringing, bringing that to the community for service within the community. Thank you. Does that add to his one minute later when he's on the panel then or not? Uh, I guess not, okay. Um, I'm Andy Bowen with the Grand Valley Metro Council and we've been doing lots of things over the last, uh, gosh, 10 years since I've been working with them, but we have kind of some new arenas we're gonna be getting into as well in the near future. But three areas for our focus have traditionally been uh, regional planning activities, uh, regional partnerships that we get involved in and uh, kind of local assistance uh, and, and kind of design orientation. Uh, in the regional planning arena, um, we've been working on uh, our framework, our regional framework for some time, 
but it's our hope that we've got some new directions coming up for that with the um, with the lead ND activities and criteria that are coming out. Uh, we really like to start working at another take at what that looks like. Uh, our regional plan can start to include some of these very same criteria and take a new look at what our whole region looks like uh, with what you might consider kind of pre-designated lead qualifying areas uh, throughout the region. We think there's some excitement to be had there. We're, we're also doing our usual amount of integrating or sometimes lack of integrating with the long range transportation plan. Uh, but I actually think with some new people at, uh, at the Metro Council, I think we're gonna make some headway in really integrating those two regional documents, significant, significant documents. The long range transportation plan for overall spending on transportation and what we're doing regionally with land use. They're supposed to be together and I think we'll finally get there. Uh, we also have our annual conference uh, that we're gonna keep working on and a lot of educational activities. Uh, our subregions, our original subregional efforts are still, are still working towards kind of grouped, grouped configurations of municipalities that are trying to do planning activities and we, we expect to continue with that. On the partnership front, of course, United Growth, uh, uh, we try to remain in a partnership with them. Uh, we work with Greater Grand Rapids Food Systems Council on some activities. Um, the West Michigan Strategic Alliance, we sit on the Green Infrastructure Board and work with them on a lot of activities. Uh, Kent County, uh, the uh, purchase of development rights, we do some staff, staff level type work with them. And we'll continue doing that, hopefully. Uh, we also have been working on low impact development manual, which by the way, this Friday, there's gonna be a workshop on that uh, low impact development manual put together by the state, which is gonna be recommending a series of types of uh, site design solutions that you might be able to adopt to better handle stormwater. And it's gonna be something consistent throughout the state. And uh, that's something you might wanna look into uh, going to that conference. Uh, and, we've, and of course, the big one for us has been Elgro, the Lower Grand River Organization of Watersheds. Metro Council is going to be getting into, oh boy, I'm the only one that did that, aren't I? Well, you know, Jay was supposed to come. <laughs> uh, anyway, the lower, the lower Grand River Organization of Watersheds is gonna be a, a, a new kind of very large partnering organization for this area. And then we're also gonna be working on, on a design center in a partnership with Michigan Municipal League. And uh, you may have heard a little bit about Jay and uh, um, Tim Cochran and uh, Terry Schweitzer and uh, Brian Tingley down in Gaines Township working on a charrette down in that area which is gonna be associated with that new uh, bus rapid transit that Kevin was talking about called Fisher Station. So a lot of activities going on. And oh, by the way, we're going to be moving our physical location in March we're gonna be moving to the immediate west side of the river, just immediately south of 6th Street uh, in the old R.C. Allen building. So, that's it. Okay, three for four ain't bad. I'm timing though, you can hear the beat. <laughs> um, I have the honor today of presenting Dave Geica with his uh, Land Stewardship Award. And after the United Growth Board determined that Dave should be the recipient of this year's award, I really couldn't help but feel that I would like to present it. Though this is traditionally a role of a United Growth Board member, I felt this is one small way I could thank Dave for the many years of support he has given me throughout my career. After all, this is true. If it weren't for Dave, I wouldn't have gotten even a, in a interview for my position. It, Dave really did that. Dave was one of the original creators of United Growth for Kent County. In 1998, Dave, Carol Townsend, and Maggie Bethel from MSU Extension in Kent County sat down with Kim Krasovac from the Fry Foundation and hatched the concept of a citizen-based model of engaging urban and rural stakeholders around the issue of urban sprawl in Kent County. Interestingly enough, Dave and Sharon Steffens from Alpine Township had to do some convincing for an ag profitability component of the United Growth Project. Dave and Sharon had to argue that farming has to be profitable, otherwise farmland preservation is pointless. This was a new concept um, just 10 years ago. The Fry Foundation seed funding actually led to the Apple Slices Project 
um, which MSU helped support. And um, now Kent County's apples are in demand today by McDonald's for their apple dippers as a result of that effort. When United Growth was launched, Dave was director of the Kent MSU Extension Office. With funding from Fry, he, he led a citizen committee that developed a survey of rural property owners in Kent County to determine their understanding of land use, such as PDR and TDR, and other agribusiness issues. Some of you may have sat on that committee, and I think there are some of you in, that room, in the room today that did. The survey was distributed to 3,000 households, and over 1,000 surveys were returned. Um, this is an unprecedented level of a return rate for a land use survey in the state of Michigan. The results helped guide the formation of United Girls Rural Committee and now the Land Preservation Education Committee. The survey and results are posted today on United Girls' website. In 2000, Dave became regional director of MSU Extension Central Region Office after Maggie Bethel was tapped as statewide MSU Extension Director. At this time, Dave was no longer able to be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of United Growth, but he kept close ties to the project. Today, as regional director, he oversees 175 Extension staff members from 16 counties, stretching from Lake Michigan to Lake Huron. Dave has always been a person who can challenge thinking and promote cutting edge concepts. He was critical to the creation of the Kent County Urban Sprawl Task Force after the Grand Rapids Retro Region was named sixth most sprawling in the nation by USA Today newspaper in 2001. It was the Urban Sprawl Task Force report that called for the creation of a county PDR program and Dave served as staff person on the committee. Dave also authored innovative presentations on the value of fruit production on the Fruit Ridge, tools for developing comprehensive farmland preservation programs, and conservation development. Dave has always been an advocate, advocate for professionalizing township-based land use planning and zoning. He was critical in the growth of the Ionia Community Foundation and developed their junior foundation for youth. Dave is truly a teacher at heart. The United Growth for Kent County Board decided Dave was the best recipient for this award after they learned of his planned retirement from MSU Extension in February of 2009. They wanted to thank him for his great contribution to the organization for his many uh, land use efforts during his career. Dave is the type of person that can't sit still. We hear he has plans to grow, asparagus, to grow his asparagus operation on his property east of Beltline, uh, east of Belding. <laughs> we hear he has already recruited two asparagus specialists, the kids next door, and he has all, always had farming in his blood. For years, he's grown pumpkins and other vegetables to benefit many creative community projects. His, Dave's wife also maintains a rose garden at home that is quite possibly among the largest in West Michigan with over 100 varieties. That's what I guess, over 100 rose varieties. We are also sure that he and his wife has plans to visit their two-year-old grandson, David, who lives in Baltimore where Dave's son and daughter-in-law, both Ph.D. professors at Johns Hopkins, live. Intelligence runs in the family. Dave is also a prankster. <laughs> Every time you went on vacation, you would check your drawers and cupboards for plastic snakes and spiders when you returned. He often sent humorous cards from his destination just for laughs. And some of the tricks that he pulled are really legendary MSU extension stories. And due to the fact that we're videotaping today, we decided not to do a prank but maybe at a later date. <laughs> so Dave, please accept United Girls 2008 Land Use Steward Award in recognition of your contribution to United Girls from Kent County and your land use leadership throughout your career. Your name will join Senator Patty Burkholtz and Peter M. Weggy as past recipients, and you will be recognized publicly with a brick in the MSU Extension Gardens at our office, the Grand Ideas Garden. Congratulations, Dave.
thank you very much. Uh, this means a lot from, uh, from such an important group as yourselves. Uh, great to be here today, and it's good to see that you've grown, and there's a lot of new faces that I don't know here, and that's what, the, what it will take to succeed. Um, a whole lot of good success, both on the rural side and on the urban side, and, and it's great to see that happening. Um, a whole lot of partners have helped us reach where we are, and I think way back to uh, um, the first grant that we got from the Fry Foundation, it was like, you want to do what? Uh, and and a thank to, a thanks to support from Milt Rohr and the, the people at the foundation, we're able to move ahead with our first uh, large grant, which led to, of course, a lot of other grants down the line, too, which Carol and Kendra have continued to receive. Um, you might wonder uh, how I, how I uh, was successful in getting Kendra hired. Um, just a little story that I know her, I know her father-in-law, and when, when she applied, he told me that she applied and that she's darn good. You better examine that one. So <laughs> but that's the story connected with that one. So again, I, I thank you for this award, and I hope the county continues to move forward with their, present, with their preservation of farmland. I, I enjoy driving home through uh, Parnell area, and I go down the road and see those signs, and it uh, really makes me feel good when I see those signs. But uh, I remember when I was serving on that commission with the uh, county commissioners and the administrator, and uh, our goal at that time was to hope for 100,000 acres preserved. And I know you're moving in that direction, and... Uh, and hope you are successful in that. So again, thank you very much for this award. Good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Van Dyke, and I am the Executive Director of Neighborhood Ventures. I am also um, on the board of United Growth for Kent County, uh, a new board member, and I um, also serve on the Revitalizing Neighborhoods Committee. Um, I am honored today to, to have been asked to moderate the Kent County Commission Candidate Land Use Forum. Um, you'll have to bear with me as I have never um, moderated a, a candidate forum. So. Um, I would like to invite all of our candidates to come up and take their seats here at the front table by your name tag. looks like we're all kind of settled here. I'm going to explain again the, um, the format of our forum. I'm going to ask a question. We have four questions. And I'm going to start right here with Commissioner Vonk. And he's going to be given one minute, as well as the rest of the candidates, to answer um, the question. And then we'll ask that, we pa that you pass the microphone over to your right. Um, you will have, again, one minute to answer your question. Um, Kendra will give you a 10-second sign. What does that look like, Kendra? Ten more seconds, okay. Um, and if you hear the buzzer, we ask you to stop speaking and pass the microphone. So um, we're going to, and then I think on the, what we're going to do is we're going to rotate so that on the second question, I'll start with Commissioner Tanis and then um, Mr. Talon, and we'll go on down the line like that. Um, does that make sense? We all good? All right. Um, the fourth question, we do have a fourth question, but on the fourth question, you can choose to either answer the fourth question or you can spend your one minute addressing another issue that you would, would like to address. So um, let's start by introducing our candidate. Um, we're going to start right here on the right, or that would actually be on your right. Yeah, your right, exactly. <laughs> um, so we're, we're going to start, yeah, I should know this. I was a theater major at one time. Um, 
We're going to start with Ted Vonk. Uh, Ted Vonk is an incumbent representing District 1, which covers Plainfield Township. Um, next, we have Art Tanis, who is an incumbent representing District 6, which covers the city of Walker. Then we have Jim Talon, who is seeking to represent District 16, covering the central city of Grand Rapids. Then we have Bob Sink, and he is seeking to represent District 9, uh, excuse me, 19, which covers southeast Grand Rapids. We have Gary Rolls, who is an incumbent representing District 4. That includes the townships of Ada, Canton, Grattan, and Oakfield. We have um, Stan Ponstein, is that correct, Ponstein? Ponstein, Ponstein who is seeking to represent District 7, which covers the city of Granville. Uh, next, we have Roger Morgan. He is an incumbent and outgoing county board chairperson representing District 3. That includes the city of Rockford and townships of Tyrone, Salone, Cortland, Nelson, and Spencer. And then we have Harold Mast. Commissioner Mast is also an incumbent representing District 12, which covers Southern Grand Rapids and West Kentwood. We have Bill Hirsch, who is seeking to represent District 10. That includes Gaines and Caledonia Townships. We have Brandon Dillon, who is an incumbent representing District 18, covering Northeast Grand Rapids. We have Stephen DeCoster. He is seeking to represent District 16, covering uh, central, the central city of Grand Rapids. And I believe that is all of our um, our candidates here today, or potential candidates. So we're going to begin our discussion. So that means I'm going to ask the first question. Okay. So the first question is, what specific role should Kent County government play in supporting purchase of development rights, or PDR? Before I start, I'd like to thank uh, United Growth for Kent County for hosting this forum and for this luncheon today. It's much appreciated, and I'm sure by the less than people on the board who feel the same way as I do today. And uh, especially thank you for uh, having the uh, luncheon in Plainfield Township, close to home, so uh, I didn't have to spend a lot of money on gas getting here. Uh, the uh, PDR, Purchase of Development Rights, I was a part of from the beginning as a commissioner. And the program that Kent County has today, I participated on from day one and support the program that we have today. There's a lot of tax dollars that the county has, that people think that the, the county should support it, but at the cost of each PDR, it'd be cheaper to buy the farm than purchase those development rights. They're very, very expensive. But as a commissioner, I feel that in the future, we should put it on the ballot and let the residents of King County decide. Maybe I'm wrong on this issue. Maybe the people of King County want to spend their money in that manner. And if they do, that's their right. So I think in the near future, I would support a ballot initiative. Thank you, Ted. You're not taking time away from me. <laughs> Is that, hey, it's working now. All right. Uh, I, uh, I would like to make a slight correction. Uh, I, it says here that I am an incumbent from the city of Walker. I also represent Northeast Grand Rapids, uh, just for your information. Uh, how do I feel about uh, the PDR program that we have now? I, I think we're doing exactly what we should be doing. Uh, we enabled we enabled the uh, the local government to have a PDR program. Uh, we support it uh, by by giving a support person uh, to uh, to the MSU extension for the PDR program. I don't believe that uh, our general fund dollars should be coming out for the PDR program. And uh, I would not be opposed to uh, to putting a millage on the ballot uh, to support a PDR program. Uh, I think we're doing what we have to do uh, at this time, and uh, that's how I feel. 
I believe that PDR is an important tool for uh, preventing uh, urban sprawl and for uh, preserving pretty critical uh, open space and farmland in this county. Um, and so is an economic development tool in that regard as well. Um, I do not have any opposition to using county dollars for supporting PDR. And in fact, I think um, if county dollars can leverage other dollars, it's an important investment that we should consider making. However, I, having been in county government for eight years before as a commissioner, I do understand that there are uh, a lot of responsibilities that the county has. And in tough economic times, uh, this type of funding does need to be evaluated by commissioners along with other priorities. So if, if the county commission as a whole believes that um, using county tax dollars for um, leveraging PDR, other PDR dollars, I think um, that's a, certainly an appropriate way to go. I'm Bob Shank, running for District 19, uh, Southeast Grand Rapids. Um, my slogan is uh, government as it should be, smart, effective, and compassionate. And I think that's just what this program is. Uh, the government here is helping uh, the, uh, the people to make good decisions about how to use uh, land. And uh, so I fully support it. I do also support using some government money to support this program. Um, if we're not going to use government money to, uh, to, to for for the betterment of our county and for the future, then you know what are we going to use our money for? Um, besides protecting the, the farmland, it can also help with uh, problems of urban blight. Uh, if it makes more sense to uh, keep the farmland, then it makes more sense to redevelop the urban areas and thank you very much uh, correction uh, or clarification Cannon Township not Canton Township I'm sorry. and uh, I too would like to thank you for hosting this uh, right on the edge of my district which is Cannon we're in Plainfield but only by a couple of hundred yards I think so what specific role should Kent County play in supporting purchase development rights? Um, I know that I personally have been working very hard to achieve uh, awareness and education in this area. We've had some very uh, successful uh, areas that have been impacted, including the Ridge, the Parnell Corridor, and uh, the southern portion of uh, Lowell and Bowen area. Our philanthropic community thus far has been uh, overwhelmingly generous, including other units of government, state, federal, local, and uh, private property. The county has been very supportive of this program since its inception, including staffing. And I believe that the county, along with the Ag Board, uh, needs to just set goals to increase local funds uh, and uh, local government and private sector funds in order to maximize and leverage the state and federal grant funds that are available. Stan Ponstein, District 7. Uh, just one clarification, it isn't just the city of Granville, I also have the honor of representing the western and northern part of the city of Wyoming. Uh, Dave, I wish you luck on your asparagus farm. My grandfather was an asparagus farmer. The growing the asparagus is not difficult, it's the two assistants that will be picking them for you on the <laughs> Um But that farm, like many, have been re uh, redeveloped. Uh, I, you know, if you ask anybody, do you believe in farmland preservation? Everyone's going to say yes. Uh, I think the difference is, is no, I don't support county use of tax dollars to do that. Uh, I think the problem with family farms is that they're not passed on. It's not a business that someone can go and say, I want to buy your farm and I'm going to be a farmer. Uh, the farmers aren't passed on from generation to generation, and that's because of the property taxes on farmland need to be lowered. But more importantly, we have to eliminate estate and death taxes so those farms can be passed on generation to generation. Hi, I'm Raj. I'm the outgoing chairman of Kent County, and uh, it's been a, just a real privilege to be chair of Kent County. Um, don't count my second yet because... Kent County, just to give you a little background, is one of two counties in the state to be have a AAA bond rating. We're very proud of the work that we're able to do at Kent County, and we leverage a lot of activity in the city of Grand Rapids and Allstate County. Now, on my comments on the PDR, I was, I was present and voted for the PDR ordinance. 
And at that time, it was about um, unique farmland. And unique farmland to me is the ridge and a few other things. I do have a problem with a typical uh, cornfield in some township as being unique. But I understand that since, uh, un since then, unique has been kind of taking out, taken out of the criteria, t criteria for, for the PDR uh, program. I, I do support the program. I am not in favor of using fund, fund balance dollars from Kent County to support it. I think that we can come together and, and get some innovative ways to make sure that this program succeeds. But once again, I am not in favor of the fund balance from Kent County that's being pressured. And especially since we're looking at $11 million deficit coming from um, our revenue sharing program from the state, we're going to be facing some major, major budgeting issues. Thank you. I'm Harold Mass, representing western part of Kentwood and the eastern part of Wyoming, not necessarily the eastern part of Grand Rapids. I was part of the initial land use uh, commission that was established by, I think, Chair Heacock many years ago and became a little bit more aware of the difficulties that we are facing in our community. As was mentioned earlier, Grand Rapids metropolitan area has the sixth worst sprawl in the nation. We also have the second largest agricultural industry in the state. This really impacts me. And during the past several decades, we have seen farmland disappear and our inner city suffer because of the inability to offer farmers some relief from high land prices that they're offered from, from developers. Because of this, I have three things that I think the Kent County Commission should do relative to the PDR effort. I understand our difficulties with financing, but I've, I've reduced the initial request down from the last couple of years. I think we need to provide a line item within the Kent County General Fund of up to $250,000 annually that could be used to leverage additional funds from foundations, townships, states, and federal sources. We've got a lot of money from the foundations, and I'm really appreciative of that, but I think they've given up. We also need to seek an opportunity for a vote of the people for a special county millage that would garner additional funding. Thank you. Bill Hirsch, uh, District 10. I unseated a seven-turn incumbent former chair on this issue. What role should the county play? a leadership role in funding the program. In the past five years, the county has not once looked at a small appropriation to the Ag Board that I used to sit on. We've missed out on hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, in matching funds from foundations, state and federal government. This is not the only issue facing the county, but it's one of the most important ones. It affects schools public transportation, taxes, quality of life of everyone that lives in the county. We cannot afford to abandon our city's infrastructure and destroy every acre of agriculture. Thank you. Uh, Brandon Dillon, District 18. Um, well, I think, number one, um, we have to look back at what the goals were set when the county approved the PDR program. And as I understand it, I wasn't on the board at that time, but the goal was to preserve 25,000 acres. Um, so far, we've preserved under 1,000. At this rate, it'll take us to about 2096 to get to that goal. So I think it's clear that the current way the PDR program is being funded and run is not sufficient to meet those goals. And if we have a program in place that has set forth um, this ambitious objective, we should put county funds behind it. Um, the county does have some difficulties, but relative to other counties in the state, we're in good financial shape, and we do set priorities. We, we found a million dollars to fund a sports commission last year, and you can argue on the relative merits whether that's good funding or not, but it was considered a priority for the board, and the funding was found. I think the same can be done with this program, and it's certainly going to be beneficial to urban areas like the one I represent. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Steve DeCoster. I'm the Republican candidate for the 16th district, which is Central City, approximately 131 to Fuller Avenue. So as you could understand, that's an urban district. I've lived in the district for about 20 years. And so I've gotten to know a lot of the urban issues uh, and a lot of the folks who are involved in those issues through the years. And on the other side, I grew up out in the country. So I've had 
20 years experience with living life in the country and appreciating farmland and open space, water issues. So I feel I can look at this from both sides and try to uh, remain open-minded about it. Just a few points I'd like to make. I think that in general I would favor any support coming from the general budget. I think that the responsibility of your legislators on the county level as well as other levels is to make the leadership decisions and the tough decisions that have to be made and not cross those uh, or pass those over to the public. I don't think that was my minute, was it? Was that my minute? <laughs> okay, so uh, just to, to conclude, I would favor leveraging our county funds the best way possible and so not to foreclose any possibilities. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to go on to the second question and we're going to um, start with Mr. Tannis this time. Um, I also do apologize if I mispronounced your name or any areas that you represent or did not accurately say the area that you represent, so I apologize for any of that. And we will move on to the second question. Um, the second question is, what do you feel should be done at the county level to ensure safe septic systems in Cape County? Uh, thank you. Uh, my opinion on, on the septic tank issue is uh, um, I, I'm against passing ordinances. Uh, I think less is more when it comes to when it comes to ordinances. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there's an opportunity here for an educational piece, and uh, let's uh, let's get with the with the realtors and and educate the realtors so that they can educate. The prospective homeowners and, and not have to go through an ordinance. I am uh, certainly in favor of ensuring safe septic systems and in uh, when I decided to run for office I started to have contact with people from a variety of sides and what I've learned over the years is that um, and I've experienced over the years is that when you get people together and get them to listen to each other, you can usually make progress between people that have perhaps different ideas about an issue. And what I found is there certainly are some different ideas about this issue, but what I've also found is that there's some disagreement about some basic facts about how big the problem is, how extensive it is, how expensive it should be, where the burden of it should lie. So what I would like to see happen um, very soon is to get all of the parties and players together at a table and to listen to each other and to try to come to some agreement on facts and certainly would not exclude uh, some sort of ordinance to deal with uh, the septic issue, um, but uh, let's see what we can do by bringing all those players together. A year ago, <clears throat> I didn't even know there was a septic uh, problem. And as I've been reading, one thing that jumped out on me, at me is that it is possible for people to buy a house and think that they are on a sewer system when in fact they have a septic tank. And that is totally unacceptable. Uh, we do not allow people to buy a house that has or might have lead-based paint and not be informed of it. And uh, we need to uh, not allow anyone to buy a house without knowing that they have a septic tank, without knowing the condition of the septic tank and without knowing the uh, requirements that they will have to uh, perform to keep that septic tank in good operating condition. Um, so I would not be opposed to uh, re re actually requiring new homeowners to um, uh, follow the recommended procedures. Also I'm concerned about sustainability. A septic tank will only last 30 years. We need to uh, not allow houses to be built that will not uh, handle uh, what will happen after that 30 years. I think we need to kind of withhold some judgment here till there's been enough evaluation in this area to give us some clear direction. Uh, to date, our health department doesn't have enough data to determine if and what challenges we do face with septic tanks. Uh, and the issues that uh, arise from it. I think we need to be careful not to overregulate our taxpayers. And I know the technology continues to improve the products that are being installed and replaced. And I believe we need to provide 
maybe some education, but there's got to be uh, some personal responsibility and accountability by the homeowners here as well. I think, first of all, we've got to look to find out what the problem is. If, if a septic tank is failing, it's, you know, to the immediate homeowner, he may or may not be concerned, but the person that's living next to him, his well may be concerned with that failing system. So, you know, I agree with former Com Commissioner Talon. We need to look at it, sit down, and, and, and at least get our facts straight. Uh, the one kind of disagreement I do have, if a program like this is enacted, I don't know if the county level is the best way. I think local units of government could handle this better. I find in my tenure in public office, the higher you get up the food chain in politics and, and governmental units, the less trust there is. I think if a program like this is enacted, it needs to be done by the villages and townships. Thank you. Um, the engineering standards for septic tanks There we go. Is second to none. I've asked the, the health department to look at their data and try to, to separate out exactly what we're looking at because I've heard of the range of a million gallons to you know half a million. And when we have a rainstorm like we just had and millions of gallons are spilling over into the river and going out into Lake Michigan, I think that we need to take a more global look at this problem. And I think we need to start out with education. I don't think anybody, anybody who's looking for a house should buy a house without getting the septic tank inspected. So maybe we need to educate the folks and get the, the realtors on board with that. Thank you. I agree. I don't think we're at the, at the point where we know enough to be able to pass an ordinance. And I think it would be very difficult to get an ordinance that people would accept and that we as a county commission would pass. The Grand Rapids area realtors do have a, a voluntary program that seems to be working pretty well. And I would support continuing to use that. They, they, they really feel that that's about 90% compliant. I think they're getting good compliance and, and we just need to take that and then continue to educate the users as well as the, um, the policy makers about what, what is needed. Being a dairy farmer in Gaines Township and working a lot of small plots of land around in and around housing developments and living in a house that was built in the late 1800s myself, this is a huge problem. Um, uh, there's a lot of fear of over-regulation. Um, a new system could co cost upwards of eight to $10,000, which the homeowners cannot afford. Um, but I don't think ignoring this is the answer. Um, it, it does need to be addressed. There are a lot of problems out there, and maybe we could offer a solution um, to update existing systems um, without having to completely replace it. Um, there's a lot of homes that were built and are being built on land that does not perk. Thank you. I still had 10 more seconds. Um, let me just uh, comment on one thing. I, I don't disagree that education is an important component of this, but I think the question is, how do you know if that person has passed the test once they've received education? It doesn't do much good for a neighbor of somebody who has a failing septic system. To, uh, it doesn't provide much comfort if, they're, if the owner has been educated but refuses to do anything about it. Um, the data, I think, is already in. I don't think it's uh, rocket science to know that there are 50,000 septic systems in Kent County, and we have a failure rate, depending on who you talk to, anywhere from 5 to 25 percent. Barry County just instituted an ordinance requiring mandatory inspections, and they're finding a failure rate from 18 to 25 and, and upwards of 30 percent on those. So I think whether you think it's a million gallons of um, raw sewage being polluted or sent into the groundwater or 500,000 gallons, it's a problem that education alone is not going to solve. I think there are ways to do this without having uh, punitive ordinances on people, but personal responsibility also means that those septic owners have to take ownership if their system fails and have some sort of way to monitor them. Well, I think it is a legitimate concern, and I've been involved in replacing a septic system just recently myself. Uh, and of course, when you have a septic system, you very likely have a well on your property. 
So the first one it's going to affect is you yourself, if you have a failing system. So any buyer is going to want to know whether he's got a good system or not. And it seems to me that the best way to address this initially, at least, is through the realtors and an acknowledgement on the purchase agreement when there's a purchase that, uh, that a septic system can be performed by the buyer and that upon results of that being known that there would be the option to pull out of the deal if uh, they find that it's not in good working order, which simply means renegotiating the sale price typically. And I think that can be handled through the realtors uh, without a, a very punitive ordinance, certainly. If an ordinance is necessary, it would simply be to acknowledge uh, that uh, a buyer must state that he's got knowledge of the condition of the septic so that we can place responsibility where it would be lying on the owner. Thank you again. Um, we are to our third question now. Oh, you are right. I apologize. He's in Plainfield Township. It, <laughs> it's not a problem. I think our health department is doing an excellent job on this is issue. We inspect over 2,000 tanks a year. The failure rate is in the 1 or 2 percent rate. Uh, if there might be some problems out there, but I don't think there's any problems to the magnitude that, uh, that we've heard about. And uh, I've looked into this, I've talked with staff about it, and um, sent letters to uh, residents of uh, Plainfield Township that contacted me on this issue. And uh, the problem is just not there. And there might be some areas where there is a problem, I'm not saying that, but uh, to the extent that uh, we hear about it, there's not a problem there, and I don't think uh, we need uh, another layer of government, another layer of septic police going around and checking everybody's septic tank. Uh, we've, we've got, uh, we talk about farming. One cow probably pollutes more than 100 individuals or a pig, and uh, we never look at that issue. There's another whole issue out there, and uh, maybe uh, that's a greater problem than what we're talking with our septics. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. I apologize. Um, we're going to now move on to our third question, starting with Mr. Talon. Um, the third question is, Grand Valley Metro Council is set to start a countywide transit study this fall. What role should Kent County government play in building a countywide transit system? In my years in county government, I've always operated from a belief that Government ought to be, and county government in particular, ought to be a supportive partner, whether it's uh, transit issues, whether it's human services, whether it's um, utilities, whether it's uh, development, uh, economic development. And I would say the same thing about public transit. Um, I look forward to the, to the work that will be done by the Metro Council and to the report. I can't imagine what that report is going to say at this point, so I not sure I want to speculate on, on an exact role for the county, but a supportive partner um, under the leadership of ITP, which I assume will take the leadership in whatever um, recommendations come from the, from the study. Well, I uh, fully support um, uh, Mass Transit and uh, the Metro Council, and I would want the county to be fully supportive of their work and even uh, to the point of uh, supporting them financially and uh, you know, working together uh, at, at any level that we can. Um, having a mass transit system is better for the people. It's uh, good for business. It's good for our economy. Uh, and in addition, we have, uh, we'll have less pollution and um, people will not have to spend as much money on gas. Uh, if, if gas prices double and you have to use half as much gas, then you haven't been hurt. And we can help people have an option to driving their cars so that uh, they can make uh, decisions that are good for them and good for their community. Uh, first, I'd like to say I'm grateful that the Grand Valley Metro Council has uh, taken this study on. I, I think that's a perfect place for them to uh, to pick this uh, um, topic up. 
As for the county's role, um, I think that that's yet to be determined, but what I can tell you is that we have been supportive thus far of uh, transportation. We at the county did uh, put together a subcommittee that studied this and included the, the rapid uh, local areas of uh, units of government as well as nonprofit organizations. Uh, from what we were able to determine, we're currently on track with um, the overall um, um, feelings of those particular uh, units. Uh, the six communities that are involved currently do have millages and they're the ones that seem to be the most interested in this topic. I think all the other uh, local units of government are going to need to continue to do a self-assessment to determine where they fall on this issue. And I think that we're doing the very best uh, with what we have to meet the needs and the demands thus far. I am definitely supportive of, of looking at the uh, study. Uh, it'll be already underway if I'm successful in, in uh, November. Uh, I think as a past public official, you know, we're good at studying things and studies are very expensive. I think uh, the real issue is how we're going to finance something like this if, if that's the final recommendation of the, of the Metro Council. And it seems like we have millages for everything. So until we have that answer of how something like this would even be financed, uh, I, I guess we could study an issue like this to death. I believe the Metro Council is the right place to handle this. Uh, I think they're involved with the transportation funds uh, from the state. Uh, I did form a committee to, to uh, look into the transportation issues in Kent County and where the report came back saying that the local governments need to come to the window. And there are six uh, communities that do participate in the ITP and uh, now we're looking to see if that's what the residents of Plainfield, Al Alpine, and a few of the outlying communities were like. But uh, the way it was left is we're waiting uh, to hear back from the local governments. Before I was a county commissioner 12 years ago, I was a Kentwood City Commissioner and sat on the ITP board, or at the time, um, Rapid Transit Board. We brought to the county a request to form an authority countywide that was not approved. The second alternative was to form an, a, an authority of the six major cities that was approved, and that's what we've currently got. I would support uh, a strong continued participation and encouragement and, and support to the Metro Council Transportation Study. Then I think uh, if that study shows we need a larger authority, a larger taxing authority, we as a county commission should uh, pass it on and approve that. I'm a pretty big fan of uh, public transportation. One of my favorite places to visit is uh, Toronto, Canada. Um, but I think public transportation really needs three things. It needs to be clean, it needs to be safe, and it needs to service densely populated areas. And this goes back to land use. The more the city of Grand Rapids and Kentwood and Wyoming sprawl out, the harder and the more expensive services are going to be. Um, if, if we can make those good places, I, I think it makes sense to service them and offer alternatives to paying $4 a gallon to put gas in your car to go everywhere you need to go. I, I too, am um, interested in seeing what the results of the study are, and hopefully um, the county will be receptive to um, any recommendations that come forth from that. Um, and I do think, you know, there is a responsibility of those local units of government to want to have some buy-in to be uh, participating in a county-wide system, but we do need to show some leadership um, at the county board level to show um, that this is a priority and it's something that fits in with an overall strategy on land use and curtailing sprawl and making sure that Kent County doesn't end up having the same kind of development and traffic patterns as a place like Oakland County which has completely dropped the ball on this. And um, I think we can um, show a leadership role and I don't want to prejudge what the study is going to say, but we should have an open mind about it. I think that encouraging mass transit is essential in this economy, especially looking at uh, gas prices and how they spiked up. And that could happen with uh, all of the different uh, events going on in the world today, it could double again. We could be looking at $8 a gallon in the blink of an eye. And so we need to be prepared for that, study it, very important. Sustainability is important, and that's been an issue forever for the bus system. 
30 years ago uh, when I was a college student. I negotiated with the transit authority to set up a bus line, a bus route from downtown out to the malls passing by Calvin College. And with a recognition that a lot of our students were living in the downtown area, Heritage Hill, East Town, so it passed through both of those areas. And then out to the mall where a lot of them had jobs. So, you know, it's just a matter of uh, looking at sustainability, density, as has been mentioned, is important, and uh, working together in a cooperative venture. Mass transit is extremely expensive. Back in 1990, when I was supervisor here in Plainfield Township, and about the same time that North Kent Mall closed, we had one mile of man tra mass transit into Plainfield Township. That cost us $50,000 a year. Recently, I was phoned, had a phone call from a, a veteran and talked about mass transit. And I said, I'll check into it on you for you. I said, maybe things have changed from the time I was supervisor here in Plainfield Township. Today, that same mile cost $100,000, doubled the price that it, that it was uh, back when I was supervisor. We could buy cab fare for everyone that was using it or would use it today. It would be cheaper than having that mass transit serve this township. Density was brought up as an issue. I think that's a real issue. You need density to make it work well. Works well in large cities, San Francisco. Chicago and other large cities, and it works well in, in densely par parts of uh, Grand Rapids. And uh, in uh, Plainfield Township, we went to the uh, North Kent Transit Authority to service those people with special needs that needed transit. And, uh, and it's worked for them, and uh, it's worked for uh, the township. When we decided to, to stop that one mile of uh, mass transit in Plainfield Township, three people showed up at our board me meetings. When we were watching the buses, we were hauling air. We were not hauling people. And the cost per gallon of gas or diesel used on that bus was a lot higher than, than other means of transportation. I was fortunate enough to sit on the original subcommittee for transportation uh, that uh, Chair Morgan uh, appointed. Um, we listened to the users, the township supervisors, uh, not everybody's in favor of, of, of mass trans transit because it is so expensive. Um, but we did find that it was a regional problem. It didn't only affect Kent County, but it affected parts of Ottawa County and, and, and other jurisdictions. Uh, and our report back to the chair was that uh, we felt that this being a regional problem, it ought to go to the Metro Council. And the Metro Council uh, took took the, the bull by the horns and is, is leading the charge. Uh, I feel that we should be a full partner uh, in, any, in any program that, that, uh, that they decide that we should have, because um, mass transit is important. Uh, uh, there are a lot of seniors, so that's the only way they can get around. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, we are now to our fourth question. And let me remind you that you can answer this fourth question or you can use your one minute to respond or discuss another county issue. And you cannot do both. Um, okay, so our fourth question is, there has been some discussion about a millage to fund county parks. Would you support putting a millage question on the ballot? And if so, do you think the fund sh uh, excuse me, and if so, how do you think the funds should be spent? Well, as I've been uh, going around this summer talking to the voters, I've been telling them that I want the county of Kent to be a partner with Grand Rapids. I want the county to be pitching in and helping work on the issues that we face. And I haven't heard, I haven't been in on these discussions about the parks, but uh, if we do have a millage on parks, I would want uh, the parks to be benefiting the people of Grand Rapids um, and the urban areas. And, and so maybe we don't want parks just out in the rural areas, but we also want to look at having parks uh, where the people are living uh, close by. I mean, maybe they'd be small, um, 
I had a, a few days once in uh, Savannah, Georgia. They have what they call the squares. Um, they have, it's beautiful little parks about uh, the size of a city block. And uh, it really enhances the urban area. So uh, we can do a lot. Thank you. Uh, I think that this needs to be looked at to determine if there's a broader interest in this particular issue. Um, successful millages in the past are those um, that have been carefully evaluated and that have provided solid education to the voters. Uh, there are a lot of things to consider with looking at a parks millage, uh, including open spaces and, and possibly even farmland preservation. Uh, I do feel it's appropriate to ask for a voice of the people to decide. Uh, however, I think we just need to be prudent before doing that. And if the county move forward with this, I think we just need to, again, assess that public interest to make sure that people are educated. I don't think anyone at the table can disagree that Kent County's got some wonderful parks. And I think the big challenge is not expanding our park system, but maintaining what we have. I think it's been wise to uh, make some of the purchases that the commission has done to add on to the existing parks. But I don't see a grand plan to do more. Uh, the problem with millages, and one of the reasons I'm opposed to them, is too many times you pit one special interest against the other. Do I vote for the community college millage, the uh, library, or the ITP, and you pit one against each other, and that's wrong. And, and we've got to stop these millages because the taxpayers are just being bled to death. Uh, if, if, if we can't find money within the current millage that's levied for the county to support our parks, then maybe we have to look at scaling back. Willing to look at it, I'm not sure that I would support it at this time. We have 6,000 acres, uh, I think, in Kent County Park system. Um, I do um, disagree a little bit. I think that uh, we need to always look out for a good deal through uh, grants and so forth as far as acquisition of parkland, and I think that's important. Uh, but I, I think this needs to be studied. But overall, I'm. I'm supportive. Our county has done an excellent job of uh, using what little money we have. Sometime back, the county commission did decide to uh, set aside about a quarter mil of the general fund money for park acquisition. Unfortunately, the last several years, we haven't been able to use that or, or tap into that. But even with that, even with not tapping into that, we've been able to expand our parks because we've got a very innovative executive director of parks, Roger Sabine, as you heard him talk. He's been able to help us get lots of private funds, lots of grant monies from federal and state mon money, and, and uh, leverage a little bit of the money we have. I think going forward, we probably seriously need to look at a park millage, but we got to really study that closely, make sure it's going to uh, be combined with other millage requests, probably as, as was mentioned, uh, combine it with a PDR, something like that, and let people decide. When I was out uh, campaigning, I was amazed at how many uh, foreclosed houses I visited, um, how many people that were complaining about the price of food and the price of gas and, and just how tough everything is. Um, I would not support, uh, at this time, a millage for parks. Um, one thing about parks that most people don't realize is they're funded three times. Every acre is funded three times. You fund to purchase the land, you fund to develop it into a park, and then you fund to maintain it, which is ongoing. Um, I support the existing parks, and, and I think Kent County is a, is a wonderful place to live because we have some really nice parks. Um, but look at agriculture. It's once and you're done. You fund it one time and you have the farmland forever. Agriculture is a cash positive for Kent County, and we're on the brink of losing it. And when we do, we will not get it back. Thank you. Um, I'm going to use about 10 seconds to answer that question and 50 seconds to do the other issue. Um, I, I, at this time, I don't um, support uh, a countywide parks millage. Um, I think we've been doing a good job at the county of developing our parks and purchasing land and making those acquisitions as we can. So I don't see the urgent need at this point. But I just want to... to in general, um, we've talked about land use, environmental protection, and transportation, and we've heard a lot of um, good debate here. And I, I do think um, we've heard a lot of um, 
talk about the cost of doing these things and kind of an ideological resistance to, to regulation, which is fine. But I think um, as all of you go out and take away um, something from this forum today, we also need to balance the short-term costs um, versus the long-term costs um, of some of these uh, priorities. Uh, just today, we're seeing an implosion in the financial markets. And I know that doesn't, we're not responsible for that at the county level, but it does indicate that um, lacks regulation and lack of oversight and an inability to see um, what the cost in the future of those things may be has consequences. So I think we do need to strike the right balance on all these issues, whether it's land use, uh, regulating septic systems, making sure we have a sound county, countywide transportation system, that we're not only looking at what the cost is to the county budget in the future, but what the potential um, expense is um, down the road for, uh, for not planning properly and doing anything. I would be opposed to a countywide millage for parks. Once again, as I've said before, you vote to elect your representatives to provide leadership, and that's what they should be doing. And that leadership involves making tough decisions with the budget, and that's one of the decisions they have to make. Uh, the expenditures regarding parks, regarding many of these other issues. And you have to be flexible so that five years down the road, you don't regret that you are tied into a specific millage for a specific thing. So in general, I would oppose specific millages of that sort. One topic I want to bring up in the few seconds I have left is that while we're talking about farmland preservation, we also need to talk about housing preservation. And the county covers, uh, of course, the area of Grand Rapids, uh, the second largest urban area in Michigan. So we have to be concerned about those issues as well. And all of those must be balanced with the limited budget dollars that we have and with the leadership that we have. The Renaissance Zones have worked very well in Grand Rapids, bringing people back downtown. And uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, excitement about that. So we need to look at those issues as well. And thank you very much for having us. I'll take the uh, other question on this one. Each one of the commissioners here has different responsibilities. We're involved in different issues. This past year, I was involved in soil erosion ordinance for the uh, county. And when that ad hoc committee was put together, which I chaired, I thought this thing's not going to happen, not going to happen. And uh, after uh, several meetings with the uh, road commission, which contacted us, it did happen. And now we have a soil erosion ordinance in the county, the only six ordinance ever passed in the county, which protects your rivers and streams and lakes and wetlands because of the people on this board, the people that served with me as a county commission, seen the need for this. And uh, so I was happy to see that pass this past year and uh, happy to be a part of that. Thank you. As far as parks go, I think that that's something that we're going to have to study a little bit uh, before we put a millage out to the to the general public. Uh, um, if we study it and, and it comes back that that that's what the public wants, then that's what we'll do, and I will I will support that. Um, just so you understand, I think that every community in this county has a county park in it. Every community. Uh, it, Kind of alluded to here that uh, that Kent County Parks are only out in out in the outer county. That's not true. Uh, the third or the first largest, I, maybe maybe the first, second, or third largest park in in the country, urban park, is in the city of Walker, which is bordered by Wyoming, in Granville, in Grand Rapids. Uh, it's 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 a real jewel. Uh, so the county is involved in the, in the inner cities. Do I really have the last word here? I don't know that's ever happened to me before. <laughs> I'm going to take the mic from you in a minute. <laughs> I want to say just two things. The first is um, I have so much appreciation for our county parks director, Roger Sabine, and we are very fortunate to have him providing leadership in this county, and I just wanted to express appreciation for that. I'm sure many of you here share that. The second thing is 
that I noticed something special about these questions, all four of these here. These are questions about long-term issues. And long-term issues are something that is, are difficult for elected officials. County commissioners here have two-year terms, and we tend to run based on immediate kinds of concerns, and people tend to vote on their immediate concerns. You've raised some long-term issues here that are critical to be thought about. They're not the easiest things for elected officials to deal with, but I want to encourage you to keep asking those questions because they are important for us to face. So thanks for asking those questions today. Wonderful. Um, thank you all. It is really clear that um, everyone sitting at the table here has put some hard thought into these important land use issues that are facing our community. So let's give them all a hand. Um, I am going to now introduce, um, again, another name I don't know if I'm going to pronounce right, so correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Elaine Stewart Isley from Grand Valley's Water Resource Institute. Um, she's going to start the second round of three-minute updates. Um, she did pronounce it correctly. I'm Elaine Stewart Isley. I am with the Annis Water Resources Institute. We are a research um, arm of Grand Valley. In the, on the Muskegon campus. We do research, community outreach, those types of things. I basically want to just give you um, brief information about a project we've completed. Um, it's called INVEST. It's the Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services Tool. It can be found online at www.invest.wri.gvsu.edu. We are beginning to put monetary values on benefits associated with different land uses in a, the seven county um, region that, that makes up the West Michigan Strategic Alliance region. So that includes Kent County, Ottawa County, Allegan County, Nuego, Muskegon, um, Ionia Berry, and now since the project, Montcalm. Um, we've attempted to value such things as food production on orchard land and uh, cropland, raw materials on forest lands and dune lands. Um, aesthetics, recreation, fish and wildlife habitat on various different land uses, uh, water supply, and erosion control issues. Um, we will be demonstrating um, a real-world application of this tool at the West Michigan Strategic Alliance's Natural Connection Summit um, on September 15th, which is at the Pinnacle Center. And I believe Kendra circulated that information last week to everybody. So that's it. Thank you. Um, just wanted to say the um, Natural Connection Summit is September 25th, so there is still time to register. <laughs> um, I'm Cynthia Price, and I am the chair of the Greater Grand Rapids Food Systems Council. Um, we are now our own 501c3, or we are about an inch away from being our own 501c3, and um, we want to thank the West Michigan Environmental Action Council for birthing us. Um, we have um, a new um, mission statement, and it is restoring connections to food, place, and community. And um, I'm hoping that uh, that's rather more abstract than our last one was, um, and I'm hoping that people can see the relationship to um, land use. Um, we have participated in um, United Growth for Kent County since before our inception. In fact, actually, UGKC was very instrumental in helping us get started, so we thank them as well going all the way back to the time when Dave Geigamo was <laughs> still real involved. Um, but uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about a program that we started just this year um, called CUSP, or Cultivating Urban Seeds of Prosperity. And as opposed to um, making the urban-rural connection, it's kind of about making the urban-urban connection. We um, are, are selling um, the herbs in particular and produce in general of community gardeners and urban ag practitioners to Cygnus 27 in the, I, I'm doing something with the microphone here, um, to Cygnus 27 in the Amway Grand. Um, we, um, it, you know, was difficult to set this up logistically for a small 
organization. Um, but we have succeeded in doing so, and we intend to um, expand that program. Um, you would be surprised at how many farms, viable farms, are in cities and the outskirts of cities. Um, so we actually are, are selling some farmers produce as well as community gardeners um, and urban growers. Um, and I would encourage you to, if you know people who might want to um, uh, make a little bit of extra money for doing what they love, um, even backyard um, gardeners, um, to contact the Greater Grand Rapids Food Systems Council. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Bolkowski from Disability Advocates of Kent County, Faith in Motion, Concerned Citizens for Improved Transportation, and a few other ne'er-do-well organizations. Um, since Dr. Williams said it was not a debate, I will refrain from commenting on any of the myths, facts, or other things commented on by our uh, uh, candidates for county government, but simply to say that, um, you know, gas prices went up again. I don't know if you noticed. And the options that we have go up way too slowly. Kevin Whistling already pointed out, you know, the good things that the Rapids doing, but the service improvements that went online uh, August 25th were voted on in May of 2007. Best case scenario, the bus rapid transit system will start in 2012. So if we don't start, we're talking again long term. I think it was uh, candidate talent who talked about the long termness of what we're doing. If we're not starting today, we are, and I hate to sound like the chicken little man, but we are doomed. Um, the state of Michigan is getting ready to steal another $5 million from the Comprehensive Transportation Fund. And as candidate Hirsch pointed out, the people in Canada are fighting over a $19 billion plan or a $55 billion plan for transit. And we're fighting each other for $5 million to take away from transit, not to add to it. So golly jeepers, if you don't get a weekly email from me, please see me, give me your card. I send out my diatribe. It's usually not this exciting or fired up, but um, by golly, we got to start pushing this issue a lot harder locally. Also, October 13th, we at Disability Advocates are hosting um, what's called the Opportunities for Inclusion Conference at New Hope Baptist Church, which is right by the corner of Division and Franklin, looking at transit, housing, um, land use, and other issues, how it all comes together, but primarily on housing, accessibility, transportation. We call it our HAT initiative. You know, we all like um, funny acronyms. Um, so see me if you don't hear from me once a week and let's get moving because I know there's a lot of people who live around here in this township and other townships who want other options and I know there are people in the six cities who want to be able to get out here because currently they cannot. We are all one county. Let's act that way. Thanks. So I'm back up here again. Um, earlier I introduced myself as the Executive Director of Neighborhood Ventures and you probably said neighborhood what? <laughs> so Neighborhood Ventures, just to give you a little update, I did this last year, I was up here last year, so if you remember from last year, um, is a small nonprofit organization that is just past our second year anniversary and we are a community and economic development organization working to improve neighborhood business districts in urban Grand Rapids and outside of downtown. So if you can't quite wrap your mind around that, there are some brochures over there and if you open them up like a normal brochure but then open them up like this, voila, you're going to see a gorgeous map that shows you all of the urban business districts in the city of Grand Rapids. Um, downtown is kind of this small insignificant area right here. <laughs> Not to build a little downtown, but we're trying to um, also uh, increase the vitality in those small neighborhood business districts that surround downtown so the whole city can be strong. So this is our map right here, and you will um, also find um, our accomplishments brochure if you um, would like to pick that up. Our mission is um, uh, vibrant business districts. Um, we want to interject vitality into the heart of each neighborhood by revitalizing its business district because your business district is really key and visible to your neighborhood. And we want to support the businesses there. 
and we have a, a vision of a city full of vibrant neighborhood business districts. And why does it matter? Um, again, many of the people in this room know that if you have a strong urban core, you're going to be more successful in reducing sprawl and preserving um, farmland and rural areas. And so we work on that urban, that urban piece that has to do with neighborhood business districts. Um, just to give you a few highlights of some of our successes in the last couple of years, as we've worked in nine neighborhood business districts, we've been able to um, attract 30 businesses, create 50 jobs. Well, I should have, a, there's a caveat there. Businesses create jobs. Um, we don't create jobs, but we have been able to attract 30 new businesses to the area. We have worked to um, help business owners, um, 30 business owners, improve the look of their building. Um, we have um, helped with marketing and branding those neighborhood business districts. So if you go in some of the areas and you see some of the wayfinding signs or some of the banners or some of the brochures, those are often things that we assisted with. Um, if you are familiar with the intersection of 28th Street and Division, we helped um, with that gateway there that has the bridges painted, Grand Rapids, Wyoming. Wyoming Bid Bridge is getting repainted. Don't worry, I just have to get the painter back up here. Um, and um, uh, we are working to find sustainable funding sources to help improve our neighborhood business districts because currently there is no, no real funding for that. So that is it. If you're interested in learning more about our organization, information on the table. Thank you. Uh, greetings from the West Michigan Regional Planning Commission. When I was coming over here today, I couldn't remember which jokes I told over the past couple of years, so I'll skip all of those. I only know a few. Uh, they had to figure like that. Uh, the, the Regional Planning Commission covers a seven-county area. We have uh, uh, six of the counties are members as a whole. Kent County uh, hasn't been a member for a while, but we do have Grand Rapids, Wyoming, and Cedar Springs as members. Uh, we have a 33-member board, a three-person staff. We're funded by the U.S. Economic Development Administration. Uh, the Michigan Department of Transportation and uh, dues as well. Uh, dues make up about 15 or 20 percent of our budget. Uh, also, special projects. Uh, uh, we have several EDA projects going on right now, or potential EDA projects. Uh, in the past year, we've received $5 million in grants for our communities, uh, $3 million in EDA grants, one in uh, Reed City to uh, expand the wastewater treatment capacity so that the world's largest yogurt factory uh, can expand. Also one in Howard City, and uh, also some land acquisition for a DNR, or from a DNR grant uh, down in Allegan County. Uh, Montcalm County, uh, we also have a grant up there for a, um, an accessible fishing pier. We're working on the City of Big Rapids master plan right now. Also uh, two plans uh, down in Allegan and Allegan Township. Uh, we're trying to fund a, or, or figure out a way to fund a, a countywide transit system up in Montcalm County right now. Uh, we're working on a seven-county asset management program with the state. Um, I just went down to Wilmington, Ohio last week to tell uh, Greenville's uh, story to Wilmington. They're losing 8,000 jobs in a 12,000-person uh, community, so we were down there spreading the word about uh, West Michigan. And... Uh, I'll stop before the buzzer goes off, but uh, thanks for having us. Hi, my name is Rick Chapla. Uh, I'll start first with my hat being that of uh, Vice President with the Right Place Inc. Uh, two weeks ago, um, we hosted uh, a bus tour of 50 officials from the Michigan Economic Development Corporation uh, who uh, we're primarily focusing on our urban revitalization successes and specifically um, how we have used effectively uh, various tax incentives and programs. And uh, so we focused on brownfields and renaissance zones and uh, 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 these 50 people, uh, several of whom had never been to Grand Rapids, um, it was pretty amazing. Uh, and it stressed again the importance, I think, of, uh, of again, of our efforts at preserving green as well as preserving and enhancing our urban areas. Uh, coming up uh, in October 15th and 16th is 
uh, the West Side Story, which is a University of Michigan Urban Land Institute uh, real estate forum. Uh, it's the first time in 23 years uh, that this event has been hosted in Grand Rapids. Typically, it's been in Ann Arbor or Detroit. Uh, the focus is around um, land use and real estate. Uh, been a part of planning that. If you have any questions about it, see me. Uh, third uh, item, I think, uh, uh, Birgit Close, the president of The Right Place, leaves Saturday for Europe. Uh, and part of her mission, as is now part of my mission is to grow the, the renewable energy supply chain. Uh, and what that means is that growing the, the array of companies that are involved in manufacturing of devices and systems, building on our manufacturing competencies around meeting the demands of the original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, uh, primarily in, in Europe. Um, and uh, lastly on that point is that the right place is hosting a forum uh, in November uh, around wind, solar, and biomass uh, supply chain um, activities. Put on my hat as the president of the Land Conservancy of West Michigan who has been involved um, with the uh, preservation of over 4,000 acres of land in West Michigan, not the least of which was our most re recent accomplish accomplishment, which was the uh, uh, acquisition of the Lost Lake property in Muskegon County, um, and uh, an absolute marvelous piece of property that, again, will go into protecting land use. And then fa finally, on a note, is that if you have not heard, I do announce to you that Julie Stoneman, our longtime executive director, has resigned and uh, is taking another position. Um, and uh, we are starting a, uh, the Board of Directors a uh, search process, um, and uh, good candidates, send them forth. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed the land use uh, luncheon today, and uh, we hope you'll stay a few minutes to talk to one another. I'd like to thank the candidates and the commissioners for their participation and the presenters. And uh, we'd like to see you once again at the uh, United Growth event. Remember the November 18th uh, coalition meeting on solar energy. Finally, do the evaluations. They're very important. Thank you very much.